Okay, hello, thank you everybody for being here and out there on Crowdcast. Um, it's really uh, such a pleasure to host this event uh, here at Woodland Pattern in partnership with the Next Act Theater um, and uh, featuring folks from the cast, the director, and a couple of uh, Wisconsin-based writers, but more on that in a moment. First, um, before I get ahead of myself, on behalf of Woodland Pattern, uh, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement and say that in Milwaukee, we live and work on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, part of North America's largest system of freshwater lakes where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnickinick rivers, rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin, Sovereign, Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We further acknowledge the grave evil colonialism introduced to these lands through genocide as well as slavery, but also via racist and xenophobic beliefs, laws, and practices that continue to inflict harm upon black, brown, and indigenous lives. We honor those who have lived and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience and are committed to the active dismantling of white supremacy. Um, once again, thank you so much for attending this event. Um, so uh, we're thrilled to host this in, in conjunction with the current uh, Next Act Theater show, God's Spies. Um, we have the great pleasure of welcoming God's Spies director, uh, David Cesarini, along with cast members Ava Nimmer, Mark Ulrich, and Zach Thomas Woods, who will be joined by uh, Peter Brzezinski, author of A Year Alone Inside Woodland Pattern, as well as translator and uh, book center manager here at Woodland Pattern. Uh, and B.J. Hollers, author of uh, several books and editor of Hope is the Thing, Wisconsinites on Perseverance in a Pandemic. Um, so we're all here for a convert, for, um, well, for performances, uh, readings, and a conversation about uh, creative practice in times of crisis and related topic, topics which are relevant to um, God's spies, of course, uh, but to us all. Um, so I want to say thanks to everyone at Next Act. Uh, thanks to AJ Magoon for helping to organize this event. God Spies is on now and runs through May 21st at Next Act Theater. Um, if you're here in the room, there are some um, flyers for it. Or otherwise, if you're out there, you can visit nextact.org. Uh, and we hope you'll come back here this weekend for a couple of events, a screening in our a cinema series on Friday evening at 7 p.m. Always amazing. Um, and uh, reading with Beatrice Simkoviak and Brenda Cardenas on May 6th, Saturday at 7 p.m., which will be fantastic. Uh, Woodlandpattern.org for more details. Um, okay, so first we're going to hear from, um, just to give you a little, we'll run down. First we're going to hear from uh, folks from the cast as well as the director of God Spies. Then we're going to hear from Peter and then BJ. And then they'll all be up here together after that to answer questions that you might have. So if you're out there or in here, I'll pass around a mic if you're in here. If you're out there, you can type whatever questions you might have into the chat and we can read those back. So. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you so much, and welcome to the folks from Next Act. Hello, everybody. This is Mark Ulrich. Hi. <laughs> Mark is playing Shax in our production of uh, God Spies. Uh, Shax, as in Shakespeare. Um, this is Zach Woods, he's playing Edgar, a young Scots lawyer, and this is Ava Nimmer, and she is playing Ruth, uh, a, a woman of, uh, of, of the night who hangs around the Globe Theater to do her thing. Um, so I, I'm, I'm David Cesarini, the, the uh, recently retired producing artistic director of Next Act Theater. It's been a great pleasure to hand over the reins to, uh, to Cody Estel uh, as Next Act continues on its journey. I had the great pleasure of, uh, of directing this play, uh, which just opened this past week. Um, but given uh, the, the, the nature of, of the, the, the topic, creativity during the pandemic and beyond, I wanted to catch you, catch you all up on uh, Next Act's recent history with the pandemic, starting curiously with a Bill Kane play, just as, as is God Spies. Back in uh, March of 2020, we were in the first week of rehearsals for uh, a Bill Kane play called Nine Circles about an Iraq veteran who had undergone some very serious and significant 
uh, difficulties and crimes in, in the Iraq war. In the first week, the pandemic was starting to creep across the country, and we heard, I think it was maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, the NBA was deciding they would not be playing. Then Thursday, it was the NCAA was going to have an indoor a bubble tournament. And then it was Friday, no, everything is shut down. Come Sunday, that was our final uh, day of the, uh, of the first week of rehearsal, we all went home and never came back uh, as a cast uh, for a, number, a couple of years. Uh, so everyone went home. There was a, a couple. I hung on in the theater space in the in the offices because nobody else was there. So, uh, meanwhile, here's Bill Kane uh, in New York City, experiencing this uh, pandemic in a more uh, probably a more concentrated effort, given the population there and given the intensity of the breakout that happened before it it came over to Milwaukee, um, and he he lost friends and tended to others. Um, he was a pro there was a deadline in early 2021 approaching for uh, this the, the the first draft of God Spies that he was that was due for a workshop, and I guess he finally sat down after ruminating all this time and carrying the story with him. In seven days, he wrote out this particular play, and the draft that we're using is that draft that's been amended with some uh, subsequent information from other drafts, but uh, it was quite a, a, a stunning, singularly focused uh, piece. Uh, and uh, it, it kind of shows, shows what he, the pandemic did for him in a concentrated effort, not to mention a time deadline, getting it, uh, getting it produced or, uh, to, the, to, its, to its first uh, workshop reading. Um, so next act went through, got into the movies, like many of us did. We started to produce films. Uh, it was very interesting, a very different process, um, and eventually we got back to Nine Circles, producing it as a film that next season in uh, uh, mid-2021, I think. So we have event clawed our way back to, to, to be doing, doing live theater, and it has come a ways in the last year and a half. But it's not without its, 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 um, the hangovers from uh, audience that went away and has not come back, uh, single ticket buyers that never had the opportunity to, to visit the first time and now we we're, you know, we're needing that sort of, um, those sort of uh, attendances to create more subscribers and all that sort of thing. So it's a slow recovery process in our business um, as in many businesses. I wanted to ask um, our three actors here put them on the spot um, in terms of creativity and what it might have done, what the pandemic times and the shutdown, how, what kind of effect that had on your creativity times uh, and, uh, um, and yeah, other, other things. So I'm gonna maybe get out of the way or... <laughs> that's, that's a group, as a group. We'll stand together. Yeah. Yeah, we'll stand together. Well, there was a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, downtime, a lot of isolation, and, uh, you know, we thought it would be a short time, and it turned out not to be a sh short at all, and uh, we quickly transitioned and learned how to use Zoom. Mm -hmm. Everything, be you know, was done on Zoom. I don't know about you guys, mm -hmm. but in, in mm -hmm. Chicago, I live in Chicago, and, and we would, uh, a group of us would do readings of, of plays, uh, I think monthly, for a while, complete readings on Zoom, and uh, lots of auditions on Zoom, and so yeah, everything was was on camera, and a lot of it has remained that way, even long after we've opened back up. So uh, yeah, things have not really recovered, not gone back to um, the way they were. How about you? Yeah, I had the same. I mean. I think we all had the experience of suddenly having to learn Zoom, if that makes, if that's a thing you can learn. Um, but at the same time that it felt, uh, to me anyway, like um, very community building in terms of we're all gonna just muscle through this and you know take up this new medium, it made me ache for our, our true medium, which relies completely on being in the room with living, breathing people. Um, so I will just say that having gone through the past couple of years, it's made coming back to our art form so much more gratifying. <laughs> Even if we're having to work to get our audiences back slowly but surely, 
um, it just made me appreciate it even more because it's a powerful, powerful thing when you don't have a screen in between. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, my experience um, was sort of unique. Mine was probably more akin to yours, David, than it was to yours, Ava, or Mark. Uh, at the time, I was uh, serving as the artistic director at the uh, Zoological Society of Milwaukee's Coles Wild Theater Children's Theater Program. And so rather than doing readings, readings on Zoom, I, like David, was working with the education department and figuring out, okay, well, how do we get programming out to our audience? Um, which included, you know, we had an outdoor stage, which was great. So at first it looked like we could stay open and do outdoor theater, but then the sort of logistics of how do we rehearse from, for that became uh, loomed large. You know, we were doing rehearsals over Zoom. I had like a little grid that I had made of the set and little you know, beans that represented the different actors that were moving around. I mean, it was a nightmare, you know? Um, and then, yep, going into a full film studio um, and, and producing uh, sometimes pre-recorded films and sometimes live films um, that, that young people were, were experiencing and, and interacting with. Um, so certainly, uh, if you find if, if any of you ever find yourself in a position like this again and you work for a company like that don't let them know that you have any sort of technical or AV skills <laughs> hide that absolutely hide that um, <laughs> but but I agree certainly with what both of you said um, that that it's been a, a joy to get back uh, together in the room and have that sense of community that we were without for such a long time yeah so now we'll get to uh Getting to the play, God Spies, uh, by, uh, by Bill Kane. Um, he, Bill's previous play that we produced was Last White Man, focusing on Hamlet and how the inner workings of Hamlet and different perspectives of, of that play. Um, in this play, he asks himself the central question, it, it, I know who wrote Hamlet, and I know who wrote King Lear, but how could those plays be written, they had been written by the same person? Um, and he, he explores that his, as the, the, just the central, the central intellectual idea. Um, and he came up with the idea, the setting of the play, which brings us to, uh, to, to getting the context. We are in London in 1603 during uh, the raging uh, bubonic plague that was going on at the time. Um, Everyone is, had all the rich people and the, the, the king due for a coronation had fled town. Um, we find our, our three unlikely um, our housemates uh, together, stumbling together at some point. Um, just in, in terms of the differences in Hamlet and King Lear, Hamlet, it, you have language that is crystal and clear. It's like a diamond edge uh, of intellectual, um, magic and, and flourish, um, it's, it's also heroic, it's also quite familiar in a lot of ways, especially when, when Hamlet talks with the audience. In King Lear, you have a much more complex, sometimes even nearly opaque uh, language, much more raw, exposed, and vulnerable from the playwright's part, never having had put words such as uh, some of these on stage before, especially in the writing. Um, so that brings us to where we are. In 1603 London, we find, um, we find Ruth sitting around a table. The wine bottle has been drained, and the young Scots lawyer comes out from the bedroom, uh, and they, uh, they have their own, their own discussion about getting to the business that he thought he was here for. Um, a little way into it, this this other guy breaks into the room or pounds on the door and breaks it down. Uh, he thinks it's someone who hired him to copy some things, but it looks like somebody in a big play, uh, for, you know, 1603 PP, no, P, what is it? PPE. PPE, <laughs> Thank you. PPE outfit. Uh, so he breaks in, and it indeed is Shaxx, as in Shakespeare. Um, and he's in the midst of, he has written the first act of his new play, King Lear, which of course Ruth points out has been done before, different authors, yeah, 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 but not this King Lear, because there's, there's, there are gonna be differences. But he has a problem, and that is he can't write much more. He gets stuck. 
and he, they, they, he gets stuck for a number of reasons that Ruth gets to the bottom of, or tries to get him to understand. Um, and that has to do with the, the, the people he's trying to write about, the, uh, the, the, the people under duress, the people who have, have nothing due to the plague, due to sickness, due to lack of care, lack of, of medical care uh, out there, and, and Shax has not quite been able to get them in focus just yet. Um, what else do we need to know? Do, do just that we're, yeah, we're all locked in here. We're mm -hmm. confined. We didn't know each other until, you know, very recently. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're confined as in a plague house. Yeah. The warders have put a big X on the door and locked We are a sick house and we're not allowed out. Mm -hmm. We've been deemed a sick house. Yeah. So they've been here for a little while now. Yeah. Idly doing <coughs> crazy things. Yes. Yes. <laughs> one, of which, one of which, just before this scene begins, <laughs> uh, the, Edgar asks if Shax will uh, pierce his ear. And so they go through that whole activity and somehow ending up with Edgar, Edgar's ear and head nailed to the table. <laughs> so he just barely gets out of that. And Ruth comes in from the backdrop, background. Mm -hmm. And off we go. So we have this committed to memory, but... <laughs> just in case. Just in case. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, things out of... We don't have the momentum. We do, things are out of context. We're not right. moving around as we usually We won't are. have a script on the night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. <clears throat> yeah? Yeah. Okay. How's the play? See for yourself. Your handwriting isn't improving. I can barely read it myself. That, don't bother. They're all the same. I keep writing the same thing over and over. It's a waste of paper. I've copied pages that put the light to that. How would you know? You've only seen one play. True, but I've read the Bible. And some of your writing is better. Not as good as Exodus, but I step up from Deuteronomy. You were doing so well. Where did you leave off? The older daughters have joined forces to throw their father out into the storm. And then uh, <clears throat> Lear says... Hear, nature, hear, dear goddess, hear. Suspend thy purpose if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility, dry up in her the organs of increase, and from her derogate body never spring a babe to honor her. If she must teem, create her child of spleen. That it may live and be a thwart nature torment to her. Let it stamp wrinkles in her brow of youth. With cadent tears, fret channels in her cheeks. Turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and contempt. That she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. Brilliant. Terrifying. Then nothing. Not another word comes. I've written up to the storm, and I pick up once he's out of the storm, but I can't write the storm. Why not? Uh, they wander about in a void. Uh, nothing can happen in a void. That's not how plays work. You need things. Just, I mean, you can take Hamlet out of Hamlet and still have a play, but you take away the castle, the court, the bedroom, the bed, the swords. You take away the crown. Take away the skull. And you've got a bunch of actors wandering around confused. You need meals, tables, and chairs. You need documents, and deeds, trees, maps, balconies, stuff. The stuff of life. They have nothing. Nothing. Clothes on their backs. You need things. Well, things, man, is what? Like us. Here. Things happen here. Like? What were you doing before I came in? He nailed my head to the table. See? That's interesting. No table, not even a nail. Write more for the daughters. Can't. They put them out. He leaves them behind. Why? Why what? Why do they put him out? Because they're terrible daughters. <laughs> Who raised them? What? Who raised them to be terrible daughters? Were they born that way? <laughs> What was their mother like? I am not interested in backstory. E exposition is tedious. He's a bad father, Leah. Go on. 
any father who would hate one child against another for the family fortune, well, he's a bad father. And? <laughs> that sharper than a serpent's tooth and um, a thankless child, that works both ways. It doesn't matter what kind of a father he was. The story starts now. Now. What matters on stage is what you see on stage. All on stage, all that matters is what is in front of an audience at that moment. What happens among the actors, how they treat one another. Now, here, only that. The immediate moment, now, now, now. I agree, the past doesn't matter. Here's a backstory for you. King Lear beat his wife. She did what she could to protect the children. The mother did. She hid the bruises. But they knew. Children always know. The oldest hid the abuse from the middle sister as long as she could, but she found out. And then the two of them protected the youngest, who never found out the true nature of the father. Who knows? Perhaps the father changed once the third came along. No. He didn't. Why didn't she leave him? When they were old enough to take care of themselves, the girls, the mother did. She threw herself off the highest parapet she could find. She left a note saying, girls, don't weep for me. Today is the happiest day I have had since the wedding. Your birth is accepted. I love you beyond words. Your mother, the former Faith of York. It's good. It's brilliant. I'm bleeding. <laughs> Did you go into the trade for them, your sisters? Backstory. But if it were a story, where would they be? The middle sister, married with several children. House and garden. Maybe. What do I know, finally? You don't, you don't see her? Who would want to see this? And uh, the youngest daughter? You have to give sorrow speech where the heart dies. You said it best, what's past cure is past care. Ruth, I lost a son. He was 11. There are some things for which there are no words. Yet. And what good would they do if you found them? Perhaps they would keep the dead alive for a moment longer. I would give my life for that moment. You could go out there into the empty street, see what you can of humanity deprived of tables and chairs and balls and balconies. See it. Take it in. The madmen in the streets, doors painted with red crosses, the naked beggars, the corpses. See the void. And see how full it is. The void is crowded and getting more crowded every day. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Gosh, it's been a long time since I've been at Woodland Pattern. Uh, <laughs> but um, well, I suppose I should give you a little context, huh? Before I jump into this reading of poetry. Um, you know, we, I mean, I think talking about the pandemic, the plague, is interesting because it's something that touched all of our lives, everyone. But for some, in, I mean, very different ways, some much more drastically, a lot of people lost people, 
Uh, some of us lost time, some of us were essential. And I'm sure there are lots of other variants. And, uh, but for me personally, the most difficult thing to deal with is like uh, the loss of community. And to be in a space like Woodland Pattern or in a space like Next Act Theater, which fosters community. And it's one of the things I love about this place the most is that uh, what we do for the community, when the community comes in and interacts with us. You're all here tonight for this reading. Some of you are joining us virtually, which is uh, quite frankly a happy consequence of this plague. Now we have hybrid events. Uh, Sorry, Mike, it's more work for you <laughs> and Marla. Uh, but I am grateful uh, to be out there broadcasting in the internet land. Um, but I think we all have to keep in mind, and you have to pardon the terrible pun, hindsight is 2020. We didn't know shit in 2020, right? Um, we were, we were scrubbing our cardboard boxes. We were like, is this airborne? Can we, you know, do we get it from biting people? Whatever. Uh, um, and I guess we're still kind of figuring it out. Uh, and I, I don't know if this is, this is correct. Someone told me recently that they, I don't know who this uh, all-powerful they is, announced an end to the pandemic. Is that true, everybody? Is it over? Is it endemic now? I mean, I think what's clear to me is it's kind of with us forever now, right? Uh, whether if it's going to be like the flu, I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but uh, uh, definitely a profound impact. And I, I was going to say stain for a moment, but there, is a, there are a lot of positive things that came out uh, of this time, despite, you know, uh, the obvious horrors of it, the loneliness, the lonesomeness, even worse than loneliness. Um, and this book that I wrote, this chapbook, A Year Alone Inside a Woodland Pattern, would not be possible without the people that used to all be and now have since returned to Woodland Pattern. Um, I think it was March... Yes, it was March, we were figuring out together you know, how, how do we keep the community engaged? How do we keep uh, you know, in touch with all our, you know, our patrons or visitors, things like that, from a distance with our door locked? And part of that was like you know, building this wonderful online store, uh, a tremendous collaborative effort. Uh, and then you know, we had our Zoom staff meetings as everybody was Zooming then. Um, and I, I can't remember who came up with it first. I, I think, Laura, you pitched the idea and I jumped on it for the prompts against anxiety. And I was like, yes, I, I, will, I will write one. And I, I ended up writing one that became the first one. It was, a, it was called, I believe, Erasuring Anxiety. Cause, you know, I'm a very punny person. <laughs> um, so I wanted to erase everyone's anxiety, but also via the act of erasure. If, if you're not familiar with erasure, it's a technique where you take a source text or perhaps other media and you kind of very disrespectfully go through with a black marker and uh, I mean, it's maybe not disrespectful, it could be an honor, I don't know. Um, take things out that you don't need and um, we had a wonderful response and so many people, I guess, needed that at that moment. Not just something to do, but something to help them cope, heal inside. And, uh, and I, was, I was looking up today and I was stunned that, I mean, we did this weekly and then bi-weekly and altogether we did 40 prompts against anxiety. And uh, not just we, 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 and not just poets and writers either. We invited visual artists to come up with, uh, with different prompts, all people from the community, poet, people across the country. It was really like this, I don't know, it was this beautiful thing that just came about. And I'm, I'm not grateful for the pandemic, but I am grateful for the ways that we helped each other through it. Um, 
especially my fellow coworkers who were working at home really hard, thriving to make sure we survive. But as book center manager, I can't really do my job without the books. And quite frankly, I wouldn't want to. Uh, I need to be near the books. So I was here with the door locked doing the contactless pickups. Um, and I started writing poems, as I do as a poet, uh, on Post-its and my notes app on the computer. Um, I never did on any invoices, though. I needed to keep those clean, <laughs> promise. Um, and then, um, I can't remember, I think, you know, it was like, uh, it was 11 or 10 or 11 months into the quote unquote year alone, which was actually 14. Um, I was like, my God, I have all these poems. I should make it into a chapbook and submit it to a local press. Okay. So, I mean, <laughs> and I did. It took me, I don't know, I had this like little manic moment. It took me 48 hours to put all these little notes and scraps together. And I had a chapbook and I submitted it. And a couple weeks it was accepted. I was like, never mind my master's thesis, which I was submitting for nine years. <laughs> it took two years to write. But no, it just, it just came out. I mean, I'm not going to complain, you know. It's, um, and it is here for purchase today and online at woodlandpatternbookcenter.com if you're, uh, sorry, business poet moment. Um, but I think I'm still okay on time, but so I, I won't speak for everybody at Woodland Pattern I won't speak for all of you, but I hope that you were able to find something during that time, that time of darkness, sadness, loneliness, to keep you through. And um, I guess for me it was easy because it's always been poetry, so I just you know, went back and did the same old thing, just a lot more alone. <laughs> um, creating during the plague. <clears throat> well... I suppose we could talk more about it in the Q&A. Uh, uh, would it be okay if I read some poems now? Yeah? Okay. Excuse me. <coughs> so I'm actually going to begin with the result of that first prompt against anxiety. So I mean, we showed up, you know, I, showed, I think we, you know, Jenny, Jenny and Laura helped me edit it down to like drafts of like, we showed drafts of how it was created so people could follow along and, and they sent some sent in their results and it was really cool. But this is from uh, the one New York Times article I could find that didn't mention the 45th president at, the, at that very day. Um, the Times, an erasure against anxiety, live. Dated as we are being urged past the right now of right now by asking labor to hold off, releasing limits, let's keep refraining from the soon. Existing could be unveiled as flowers bloom. We must rescue many talks. Face time, more generous talks. Continue reading. Thanks for reading. Stones are elsewhere, profess the people's movement. Gatherings attempt to keep our spirits in wind. Evenings applaud as a show of defiance. Tangled rivers bolster culture. Continue reading. Here's what it was like easing the precise public sonorous refrain of art. Our homes will grow. Art, even a single ounce, as a, is a welcome recommendation. We require a new place to exist, persist, continue reading. Out of the mind's cast iron pans, first ready with crackling conversation, the five-sided thoughts wrestle, dearest rocket, stay longer, continue reading. A dwindling box can be extraordinary. Please produce, equip, and continue reading. Stark, we ear each other. This project is urgent. Art is a patient. Would people afford to not make art? We have to move every barrier and not exaggerate the potential of known drugs. The true remedies have been community. Continue reading. 
It is important to give hope. It is important to hope. And that's not the first poem in the chapbook, but I, I think really, I guess I, I, I kind of realized today when I was you know, preparing, um, it really was the impetus for it all. But uh, uh, mostly it's a kind of like a short, quippy book. And like, you know, I talk about, you know, this sandwich that I owed Mike and I forgot to pay him back. And, but anyway, <laughs> uh, he'll never know. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to read some of the, uh, the little short ones so you can kind of get a feel of the chapbook, and then I'll finish with a couple that I wrote during the pandemic but outside of this project. March 15th, 2019. I started working at this cool literary nonprofit book center I had been going to for 16 years and volunteering at for maybe five. It's called Woodland Pattern. It's like an organized mess of retired trees. <laughs> Newly PhD'd, I finally had vision insurance I didn't need. <laughs> Thanks for the benefits, by the way. <laughs> um, March 15th, 2020. Covidity in the city, panic in the disco, cats in the cradle, the pandemic's cruel spittle is unleashing, and the bookstore closes for browsing. I have worked here exactly a year. My year alone inside of Woodland Pattern. Well, not always alone. Sometimes Lorene is here watching. And we give you a little bit of context. There's a portrait, uh, paint, uh, the picture of Lorene Niedeker, kind of our uh, patron poet, over where I sit up front. Um, And there was, there was a lot going on during that time. I don't know about your apocalypse bingo uh, cards, but like Murder Hornets, Pripyat by Chernobyl was on fire. I was like, well, that, that was just, <laughs> hope we could tame that one. I don't know, what, what, what else, what, else, what other craziness do we have? Do you guys remember? I, it was just so, there was just so much madness. I mean, but also important things happened too, lest we forget, I mean, uh, uh, later on in the pandemic, people were, you know, were tired of being confined and some very important social justice protests were happening uh, in the summer, so Black, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so there's poems in there about that, but in general, like, you know, I'm gonna return to some on lonesomeness. Dating in the 20s, so many apples so little time to peel them, so many lost seeds. Babies. Babies can't walk, but babies can die. As easily as a puppet can burst, steam pushing out a last breath, sour death, I will not leave any babies on earth. My legacy is life menacing towards death at every drink, puff, and bite. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear my trousers is mold. Hmm. And then I started thinking a lot about the economy. And I, was, I don't know, was it, was it a GIF or a meme? I can't remember, but like it was early on in the pandemic and there were some astronauts looking at from the International Space Station and like an asteroid hit Earth. And then one astronaut says to another, oh no, the economy. <laughs> As if that was her biggest concern at the time, right? Um, I mean, of course, important, but... Um, a gilded lining. I'm so baroque, my poverty has frills, my poetry trills, and baby, oh baby, I got stanzas for a baker's dozens of dusted dark clouds stretched gold in a, uh, on an endless sky of anxiety. Oh, I got stanzas, I got stanzas, like I got bills. The next one, excuse me, uh, kind of serious, but it's also a little bit fast, and it's mostly one sentence. The politeness of terror. 
I began dreaming about an American carnival in which I was an overweight strongman waging battle with other more or less over-something strongmen in an effort to pay off a non-specific medical expense and a non-specific business slash war endeavor of that America's American president. And not unlike in our own world, I woke up in a measured terror. My breath was taken and I was afraid of the cracking sepia documentary that would slow fade ajar before me when shutters blinked and clicked and I woke up because not waking up in a fetal half sand sandwich of panic politely skewered with javelins neatly frilled and colorful at each end was a different kind of terror I could not afford. I could not afford to avo avoid terror or labor as labor was my capital and I, as the child of immigrants, was programmed to the deepest deep dish of a television remote controls default settings of the heavy orbit of cast iron education clad in appropriately laced drapes of sheer platinum elbow pads costing a Judas's worth of silver only to fold and humbly display with a dim dissipating cloud of pride the, the pieces of finely pressed paper more easily torn than aluminum after and mostly during an undead dance of requisite uh, exquisite, onerous, miscellaneous, superstitious, excrementious, ballet-like labor for which the breathless courtesy of other bodies is exemplified, measured, and extracted by the invisible manufacture of teeth, barely, but bigly maintained, polished, and entombed by the relative distraught polka, assiduous resquacherumba, and or to mesentango of minimal wealth brought by the very maximum securely earned labor and diligent service to the gilded crown of deliriously unburdened bodies to whom they must smile. We have kept this our secret until now. Like many immigrant families, we thought the carnival was just a machine cranking the clock's limbs homeward. We thought the carnival was for the good of the troop, for the good of the team. So, for, I, I, I mean, the pandemic was especially challenging for uh, Okay, uh, for everybody, but uh, I, not only, you know, uh, like taking care of the books here at this 40 year old nonprofit, I had this other 40 year old business that my parents ran, and we somehow had to make that survive. And uh, so, uh, so I talk a little bit about the restaurant stuff in there. Um, okay, I'll. I'll go uh, end, to, uh, end the book with this poem, March 15th, 2020. My two year work anniversary and I have lived a year alone inside of Woodland Pattern, the only place in which I've ever wanted to be so alone. It's mostly a funny book, by the way, it's not all. <laughs> It's, it's, it's not all like, you know, r radical labor stuff. And it's mostly jokes. I mean, there's contactless pickup lines, which I just thought to spare you. But um, and I can, I'll, just, I'll just finish with two poems I wrote during the pandemic outside of it. Yeah? Okay. I'll be quick. Uh, a Merry Decline. Dreams become rigid. Dialogues were replaced with tables and equations that no one could solve, perhaps Deuteronomies or Decalogues. Everything was remade to be formal, a dance where none could think and all would fail constantly. The cha-cha of ungrateful hollow losing. It was nerves, I say, it must, must have been guts, or aging, or coming to terms with limits, they said. Determined to deteriorate, I didn't like a bit of it. Each new day grinding towards a painful foreclosure, a resignation of thought. Is this my Mardi Gras, a forever collapse? Resolve fled and the invisible claw marks of indifference clung to the staleness of breakfast air, all farts and coffee as I remember it, linging, lingering yet fresh like the cruelty of another dawn. And I'll finish with this one because... Um, the the war, uh, I mean, it seems like, well, the war in Ukraine's been on my mind for a long time, and uh, I know it's kind of it's not in this timeline of that first, for the first early pandemic, but it still feels like a part of the whole experience to me. Fields of flame. I'm tattered. The droops of my eyes fold clumsy over the crease of my powder blue mask like old paper waiting to die. I look to the east and the motors of history are ticking again, humming brass coils flick with the electricity of dominance. Murder is murder, says murder. 
What neighbors are neighbors? A thousand years of brothers shed, and ever since and ever after, our soils mineralized with the heavy iron of common blood. Somewhere caught between the seas, a sack of stolen potatoes spills out, and no one has the metal to pick them up. The sky blotted with a regiment of bundled flames. Soon it'll be time to plant sugar beets. The borscht we make are almost as similar as the tongues we use to slurp them. What will we harvest this year when all we've sown are bombs? Thank you. I, um, I generally have a strict policy of never following actors or Peter, but I'm breaking both of those tonight, so thanks a lot, Mike. Um, no, but truly, thank you for putting this on, and thanks, of course, to the wonderful crew at, at Woodland Pattern. This is really a, a kind of a beacon of a place for many of us on the western side of the state, seeing what you're doing here and kind of learning from you all and trying to incorporate a lot of the great work you're doing. So uh, thanks for all that leadership. Um, Gosh, I had all these like prepared things, but then listening to you all, just kind of want to respond to some of what you all said that really reminded me uh, in good ways and bad ways of some of the things we were all experiencing together in, in different ways again. And, and one line from the, the play that really struck me, um, there are some things for which there are no words. First of all, beautiful cadence to that line, but also just, I think that was exactly what I was feeling when those early days were occurring where the NCAA canceled and then the end, of course, it was like one sports thing after another until it went beyond the sports world, but, but that idea of like, there's nothing left in the pen, why bother, why am I worried about the next line when there's a lot of other stuff to worry about? And then Peter uh, made mention of something too that kind of resonated, I'm not, I'm not grateful for the pandemic, but I'm grateful for the people who got me through it, some version of that, and I, feel, I felt that too. I think you kind of really figured out who your friends were, uh, whether they were close or far away, who were willing to do the old, beer zoom or whatever we were trying to do there for a while you know or just I, I got in touch with my college tennis team once like it was just interactions we would have never had in, in normal life um, and then you also said Peter this idea of, you know some of us were essential and then those of us who weren't necessarily essential by way of that definition of, of what essential was medical workers that kind of thing I think we all wanted to try to find ways in which we could try to be a little more essential to someone in some way and I, the last time I'd felt that actually was in Tuscaloosa. There was a tornado, and I was in grad school, and a bunch of, you know, writers are kind of like, we don't know how to use this chainsaw. We really can't pull someone from the rubble. We don't know what we're doing here, but we're going we're to write you this poem. We're going to try to do this. We're going to hand you this water bottle. Like, we were just all trying to do something, and maybe it wasn't like a huge help, but it, it made us feel like we were a part of a community that was struggling in the ways that we were. Um, and so I think... When it, when it first was starting to strike, again, I'm thinking, how can I be of some value to someone? And so I put on my, my superhero cape of online researcher, and, and I was looking at how um, Wisconsinites in 1918 handled the pandemic. And I don't know if you, you're familiar with this, but we kind of knocked it out of the park. Like, I don't want to take credit for it. I wasn't born until 75 years later. But um, 1918 folks in Wisconsin were, like, on the same page. They were working together. It was, like, statewide cooperation, community cooperation. And so I wrote this for a, a publication, a local publication in Eau Claire. And my buddy was like, we got to make this into a video. We should make this a video so people can see and then get inspired and try it again. So cut to, like... March 24th or something, like 6 a.m., we're out in the cold, we wanna get the lighting right, so it's like outside and we're freezing, and we're like eight feet apart, worried that maybe we're gonna infect each other, just the two of us trying to do this video, and we have like teleprompters, like we're trying to really do this in a big way, um, and so I'm the, I'm the spokesperson for like telling people how to get through COVID, and it, you watch this video today, the, the, the worst part about this was like a lot of people watched this video and like thought this was the way, this was the path. But the fact that I am the person telling people like what they should do, I have an MFA in writing, like no one should be listening to me about medical matters at all. But, um, but it, did, it did help some people in some ways. And so it goes back to this idea of essential. How are you essential? I think we were, many of us were frantically grabbing for something we could do to feel useful to someone, um, which is kind of where this book came from. Once I got off my um, foray into the world of attempts at viral videos, um, I, I put out a call through the Chippewa Valley Writers Guild, which is a, um, 
a regional writers organization we have in Western Wisconsin. And I just said, all right, folks, let's, um, let's hear where your hope's coming from, you know? And basically there was only one rule, well, two rules, 500 words or fewer, so keep it kind of short. And we had a riff off of the uh, Emily Dickinson title, Hope is the Thing with Feathers. So hope is fill in the blank. Um, so I kind of put that call out there, a day passed, nothing came in, but by day two, my inbox was like flooded. And it was like, it was suddenly I had a purpose again. Suddenly I wasn't so unmoored and it was, Cool, because sometimes these people, these um, pieces were from like former students from seven or eight years ago. They were from like a neighbor. They were someone I'd never met, but worked at the university. Someone from across the state. It was coming from all over the place, um, and people were finding hope everywhere. A couple titles: Hope is a Dad Dance. Hope is a Birth Plan. Hope is an Unblemished Banana. Hope is a Hawaiian Shirt. Hope is tying a bear to a chair. Hope is a dog with a cold nose. Hope is a bruise. That one's from Dasha Kelly Hamilton. Many of you know, hope is the cat that coughs up a furball. Hope is a John Prine song. Hope is a three-pronged fork. Hope is a coin flip. It was coming in so many different directions um, that I was just, it was so, it was so exciting to wake up in the morning and, and check my inbox and see this flood of hope. And then suddenly I had this opportunity to kind of just push it out there with this network we developed. And it became this weird thing where everyone was like jumping up in the morning to check what the hope was that day, you know, and it really felt like we were trying to continue that community um, any way we could, which was pretty cool. Um, so the last thing I'll say before I, I read a, a very short piece, um, Jim Higgins of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reviewed this for us. It was really sweet of him. And uh, there's a quote I really like. He said, if more than 19 months of pandemic and political turmoil have made you feel leery about cozying up to fuzzy words about hope, be not troubled. Most of the con contributions here are grounded, even tough-minded. And I think that's was sort of the strange curveball of this project was that hope became kind of subversive. Like there wasn't a ton of it to go around and as that summer went on, there was less of a stomach for it. <clears throat> and someone I think, I, someone was mentioned, it's kind of like people thought hope was a, like a telescope, but what we needed was a rocket ship. We just wanted to get there and not just look at it from afar. Um, and so it was neat to, to put this book together. This was kind of the, the the end result of it, it's 100 uh, different looks on hope from people statewide, tons of folks from the Milwaukee area as well. Uh, and again, just the breadth and depth of these uh, moments of hope was pretty cool. And I think the, the last thing I'll say, um, I was trying to figure out like what, what, was this in, what was this intention going on within me that I, I felt this need to try to do this thing. And I think I was listening to a podcast and I heard a quote from Maxine Hong, Hong Kingston, and maybe some of you have heard this quote or felt similarly. Uh, she said, you know, in times of destruction, create something. And that felt like this like clarion call for me, like, yes, that's exactly what we should be doing. Um, but it was tenfold more exciting for me to create something collaboratively in a time and place when it felt like collaboration wasn't possible, at least in the ways we knew prior to that. So I'll just read a paragraph or two um, from the opening. This is kind of from the introduction of the book where I was finding hope <clears throat> during this rather hopeless time. Shortly before sunrise, I strap my seven-month-old daughter into her stroller and take to the sidewalks around our western Wisconsin home. For three months now, this has become our ritual, our anchoring to the earth. We strike out for several miles, observing no humans, but instead the natural world grown bold. And not just backyard critters. Sure, we see the squirrels and the rabbits, but some days we see deer too, traipsing down the streets, bowing their heads between the neighbor's gardens. They sample all that has sprouted, chewing noisily before continuing their movable feast. If the deer see us, their recognition hardly registers. Perhaps they sense that we are no threat. Hope, for them, is a patch of fresh flowers and no one to shoo them away. Hope, for me, is sharing with my daughter, who's been quarantined half her life, any glimpse of the world we can get. Leaning low beside the stroller, I whisper the names of those creatures just ahead of us. Dear, I say, dear. Her eyes widen, her world expands. Sometimes hope is a humble thing. Lately, we've been venturing further, and as our miles increase, so too do our interactions. By sunup, the wildlife begins to give way to our fellow humans, most of whom walk alone or in pairs, and many of whom are masked. Under such conditions, I can't see their smiles, but I can feel them. We demonstrate our affection for one another by other means, most notably the wide berths with which we have become so commonplace, steering ourselves from the sidewalks like some terrestrial version of synchronized swimming. None of us need to say anything for our message to be clear. 
By way of our detouring, we are telegraphing empathy, acknowledging shared responsibility, and reaffirming humanity too. Sometimes even the humblest actions are hopeful. One morning, as a walker and I engaged in the awkward who goes which way shuffle, we both found ourselves laughing at an experience that seemed equal parts necessary and absurd. Eventually, the walker and I worked out the details. She went left, we went right, and then we both continued on our way. But before she was out of sight, I turned the stroller around so my daughter could get a quick look at the creature just ahead of us. Person, I said, person. We continued on, one foot in front of the other, moving toward that better world. Thank you all. Yes, I'd invite um, everyone who's participated back up. Thank you um, so much to you all. Um, and now we'll have time for questions. I'll have my own uh, microphone in the back to pass around to those of you in the room who might want to ask a question. Uh, and if those of you up here would use these, that way people on Crowdcast can hear you. So. Tough without an icebreaker, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so does anybody in the room? I will remind people on Crowdcast too um, that you can share questions, ask questions via the chat if you would like. Does anyone in the room have a question currently, presently? Um, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all for sharing your different experiences, and they are very different and very wonderful to hear. Um, I'm curious if you were able to engage in other types of art, or were you focused very much on preserving what you felt was your own? Well, I suppose I'm holding the mic already, so I have to. Um, I don't know. I, I guess you know, with getting more involved with Instagram, I thought I, for a minute I thought I was a photographer, <laughs> taking really interesting shots in uh, portrait mode. Uh, but quite frankly, no, not 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 really. I mean, I, I used to draw more often, but uh, I think this it just sharpened my focus on poetry. How about yours? Um, well, I think we all had our brief foray into ukuleles, um, so we had that that buying spree of ukuleles. We just recycled ours or, or gave it back to a, a thrift store recently. It served its purpose, got us through. Um, we, of course, worked toward bread baking for a bit. I think we all collectively did that as a society. Um, and what else? We bought a we bought a trampoline during this period. It was kind of like a a great way to placate the children. It was just awful. Like we had to put our dog down like right when it was happening. Like it was just so many bad things at once. So we thought we're gonna buy this trampoline. And it was cool because A, the kids were always in an enclosed space. And so like they couldn't get too far, but it was outside and they could always be there. And they could like, we were camping out on this thing. It became like this whole lifestyle. And so it wasn't really art, but like I probably jumped 10,000 jumps on this trampoline that summer. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'll go from, uh, I touched upon it briefly in earlier remarks, I think, well, and, and you guys did too. We learned, we learned Zoom uh, to, to, to try to bring our art form into this in a very different uh, two-dimensional medium. We, we got very adept at self-lighting. They were much more, uh, much more sensitive to that. I mean, and there were, and the th new theaters were, were, uh, adapting Zoom for more than just a, a play reading of four talking heads at once, uh, they would they got more adept at, at uh, green screening, 
um, and and uh, f f shooting, re recording from different locations, from people's homes, all coordinated through a central uh, switching and recording space. Um, I mean, you must have done some of that, or right? Yes, oh, yeah. the, the, the <laughs> nod. <laughs> <is there. laughs> yes, um, I, I think you know one thing that that I learned that was interesting. I, I, I would call um, educating an art form. Uh, which I certainly engaged a lot more in, and um, you know, we I worked in the education department at the Zoological Society, and we we engaged with um, infants all the way up to high school students, high school age students, and a lot of that uh, material and that programming before the pandemic was tactile was make here's a piece of art you can make here is um, a, 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 a bone a, a, an elephant tusk that you can feel um, but how do we transfer that into as you said a two-dimensional uh, screen version that still feels interactive that still feels like the kids are doing something instead of just watching TV um, so it's it a real challenge but but ultimately very rewarding in a lot of ways too and actually your question just jogged my memory that um, I I aspire to write for the stage but I don't have much experience in it and uh, when I was, you know, sitting in my apartment alone with no opportunity to act, no opportunity to even go out and make money at a side job, which is what I'm normally doing when I'm not acting, is just like, how can I make money? How can I survive? Um, I actually did, uh, I was forced to write. <laughs> and that was a gift. I wrote my first, um, you know, piece that was all my own and I submitted it to a little festival, and then it got produced in 2021. So yeah, that was a, that was a nice thing to remember. Thanks for asking that question. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I, for the most part, I'm you know, uh, 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 pretty much a theater guy, and I've, d I've done a lot of writing as well, but uh, uh, not so much in the pandemic because my time was occupied elsewhere. But, but I will say that I uh, just being forced to, you know, we are all of our auditions uh, are all had always been live. You go into a room and, you know, you you're given you know a certain amount of time or yeah, you know you present the material and then you walk out, or you might you might you know interact with them a little bit. But um, uh, it all went to on camera and you know you're using your phone so I I, I had to learn <laughs> how to put auditions on my phone and send them and that was a that's become you know it, it almost like filmmaking now because you know you you think of it you think of your auditions differently uh, you know, you, they're self tape uh, they're, they're, they're different they're you have to see them you have to watch you them have to see that's right. That's right. And you can, right. And then you watch them and then you delete them and you go back and, and, and try to, and do it better. So it, it, it's, it has evolved for me and probably for you, you guys as well. Uh, we were just forced to do it. And uh, yeah, now I think of them completely differently. And they, you know, they have a beginning and a middle and an end and they're, they're, you can get creative with them too. So there is that. And as you were all talking, I was thinking about how difficult it must have been because, you know, as poets, uh, editors, translators, we, you know, we can take our pens and our paper anywhere, but you guys can't bring a stage with you. Uh, I mean, as much as you'd like to. And, uh, and I did think of something. I, I mean, if, if art uh, can, can do, uh, do uh, TikToks of my cats count as art, <laughs> I made those two. Okay. Yeah. All right. Then I was a multimedia artist during the time. <laughs> Thank you all very much for the answers to that question. And um, we have one on Crowdcast from Darlene. Oh, from Lolly. Hi, Lolly. Um, uh, the question is, how has the COVID isolation experience impacted your present outlook on life? Um, I mean, I just, gosh, it's, it's, 
cathartic to go back and think these things through with people like this and a bunch of strangers. It's lovely. Uh, it actually really is cool. Um, but I just, um, I, I, it was like this great pause, you know, like it was totally acceptable to not do anything for a while. And that was like doing the right thing was just like hunkering down. That was the thing, you know. And so what I wish I was saying now was like I learned to slow down and treasure this moment and maybe not go on social media so much, no offense to social media, um, and, just, and just kind of like be present. And unfortunately, I've kind of slipped back into the old routines, you know, and I think a lot of people have where there was a moment where it was perfectly acceptable to do not nothing, but just do things differently at a different pace. And now, so quickly, we've forgotten how good it was to not have to have a million things bombarding us. Um, so I lament it, but I wish I wish I kind of held on to that lesson and changed in that way for the future. I'll speak candidly, and it, it really wasn't pretty. I... Um I think uh, as far as lifestyle-wise, life changes. I mean, I d became drastically more involved in some of my more destructive behaviors, and I think this was true for a lot of people. Uh, people were drinking more. People were, I don't know, there were you know, a lot of takeout, things like that. And um, it was, I mean, it was a very difficult thing for everyone to go through, and we all coped in different ways, and I had several too many, and I'm g getting back to a place where I can be a healthier, happier individual, and it, it took some time. So um, it wasn't all sunshine and roses, but uh, here I am, here we are still, and I'm grateful for that, and perhaps more gratitude. Um, I'm not sure about outlook on life. I, I think I'm I am lighter for the for the circumstances I'm living in now. Um, one one very big help in our lives. One my my family, my wife and my daughters, um, and my mom and my sister, who are both out of town, but kept in great touch. And we visited uh, when it was again when we could calculate it was safe enough and test enough to do that. Um, but one thing that brought us, uh, certainly brought my immediate family together and survives till this day is a very small puppy dog that was <laughs> seven weeks old that we got in the uh, spring of 2020. Um, nothing like that. It was the, it, there, that was the perfect time to be able to do it when uh, we were, my wife was working from home. Uh, I was more available f uh, for home time. And so uh, the, the, the hectic life that we had led previously fi was finally, uh, ha f it was finally room enough to allow that to come in. So um, a, a blessing in that way, in the, s the same way with, uh, with your daughter and, um, and the time, yeah, the time to spend. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you were saying before, uh, talking about things like getting in touch with, with groups of friends that you, you had missed out on, and, and I feel like that was a real um, valuable lesson that I learned. Um, I, I reconnected with a, with, a, with a number of very close friends and a group of friends that I have since been able to take forward as we, you know, hopefully are moving out of pandemic world and, and use for a variety of things. Used for, you know, we, we weigh in on, uh, you know, work advice, job advice. We are a, a fitness accountability group. We are, you know, a, a support system when, when somebody has some sort of, of, of life struggle. So it, it really has if helped, helped me uh, know who my friends are and value those relationships and deepen those relationships and, and I am grateful for that. Um, if there are any other res responses, most welcome. Also, if there are any other questions, either here or on Crowdcast, maybe we have... Uh, well, also, that is a... Um, quite wonderful note to end on, too, um, thinking about how you're all presently impacted. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, thanks to everyone here. Thanks to everyone tuning in on Crowdcast. This has been wonderful. Uh, really grateful for the experience, and hope you all have a wonderful night. <laughs>